All right, everybody, welcome to our last show for the day. And what a show it is, because I am very happy to welcome back Jacob Greer from Portland. He, is, uh, he was with us uh, two years ago, and I think his beer cocktail show was perhaps among the best things that we've had on the stage yet. Um, so yeah, welcome back. Perhaps uh, you'd like to say a few words about yourself as an introduction? Uh, yes, thank you so much for having me and uh, for the kind words there. <laughs> I, you can uh, clap. Yeah. <laughs> thank you for the cue. Yeah, so I'm, uh, unlike most of your speakers here on the beer stage today, not primarily a beer guy. I'm a cocktail guy, but I live in Portland, Oregon, which is one of the best uh, cities for beer in the United States, if not the world. And when I drink, I usually rather drink beer. So I'm a cocktail guy who drinks beer, uh, which is how this all came together. And then a few years ago, I released this book here called Cocktails on Tap. Uh, which is probably the worst titled book, I think, in uh, modern cocktail history. It's marvelous. Yeah, the, it looks great. And uh, when, when we designed this, we had to do it so far in advance. Uh, we didn't know if, uh, if we called it Cocktails on Tap, if people would think it's about how to put cocktails into kegs. And then that became a really big trend in the United States. And so everybody thinks I wrote the book about that. And nobody knows that I wrote a book about beer cocktails. Uh, so I've, I've gotten... Um, a few consulting gigs out of this, because I eventually just decided if somebody offers me the job and they don't even read the subtitle, they deserve what they get. So I've, I've learned a little bit about how to put cocktails in kegs. So uh, but that's why you gave it like a little dash. What's that? Like, yeah, there were, it's and beer. And beer. It's, you would think that's enough. Um, but people don't, people don't read that far. And uh, the, the book, Beer Cocktails, that title was already taken. So uh, somebody beat me to it. So I know that for my next book, a very literal title is the most important thing. Don't try to be clever about it. Uh, so this is the, the attitude towards uh, beer cocktails that we hear most often. Uh, there's not much you can do with beer except indulge in the pleasant task of drinking it. Uh, so this is from Esquire's Handbook for Host, which came out, uh, well, it came out in many years. This is the 1949 edition. Really fun book full of great illustrations about how to serve drinks at home. And uh, this is pretty much the attitude they had towards beer, was you kept a bottle cold, you put it in the refrigerator, you served it, really nothing else you would do with it. And this is the attitude that uh, a lot of beer drinkers have as well. When we started doing beer cocktail events, we would have uh, beer nerds come up. Uh, they're kind of like uh, single malt scotch people, where they don't want you to mess with the beer. So if the, uh, the, they think the brewer made the beer perfectly, so why would you mess with it? Why would you change the brewer's vision by trying to use it in a cocktail? Yeah, I think uh, that's something that we have in Germany a lot, because when, when you talk to people about mixing beer, the first thing that comes to their mind is Radler, or, you know, Schöferhöfer, Kaktusfeige, or something like that. And uh, they think it's really cheap lemonade or syrup mixed with <laughs> beer. And that's not what we're talking about, obviously. Yeah. Um, and then we talk to brewers, and brewers love this idea. So they, they, despite you know, the, uh, the beer people saying, oh, the brewers have this perfect vision and you shouldn't mess with it, all the brewers we talked to were really excited to uh, see their cocktails in beer. And uh, we can get the first drink coming out, too, if we, if we want. Uh, the, the other, uh, this is right before my book came out. Uh, this was the New York Times, their attitude. I like beer. I like cocktails. I don't like beer cocktails. It's a shotgun marriage that can lead only to discord. So this, uh, this was uh, Robert Simonson, who's the cocktail critic for the New York Times, obviously had some really bad experiences. Uh, this was before my book came out, so I'm not going to take any blame for this. Don't know if his attitude has changed since then. Uh, so that, here's the question. Is, is a beer cocktail, is that a stupid trend, like drinking out of bones? The bone, has anybody done a bone luge, by the way? I'm curious about this. Show of hands, no. OK. That's another thing I'm responsible for, is drinking out of marrow bones. It's caught on weirdly uh, around the world. So I, I can say it's dumb, but it's also really fun. Uh, but what I would actually tell you today is beer cocktails uh, are a worthy trend and something that uh, you should embrace and that has actually been going on for a surprisingly long time. Basti, have you done, or Dirk, have you done a, a bone luge yet? Got a what? A, a bone luge? No, what's that? <laughs> <laughs> We're going to have a short digression here. This is not the focus of the, uh, of the seminar. Uh, so this was something we started in Portland uh, completely on a whim because uh, I was at a bar where they had these beautiful long marrow bones and I was there with a, uh, a tequila rep and so we had bottles of tequila and uh, the idea just popped, the bone luge. And so now it's become a thing where you drink sherry or tequila or bourbon out of the bone after you do the bone marrow. So next, wow. year, next year, I'm coming back, we're doing a bone luge seminar. 
It reminds me a bit of uh, the, the traditional way to drink Berliner Weisse, um, which was not with syrup, but uh, with a caraway seed liquor. Oh, and uh, cool. you yeah. had to master the art of holding your beer glass and then holding the shot glass on top of it <laughs> and drinking it at the same time so that the, the liquor would flow into the beer. So Ooh. Elina Weisse mit Strippe, give it a try. All right, we'll have to practice that. So thinking about beer cocktails, why would anybody do this in the first place? It does seem a little bit strange to us now. But if you look back historically, uh, you have to understand how beer has changed. So right now, normally, if you get a beer, unless something's gone really wrong, you probably know what you're getting. It was put into a steel keg that was hopefully sanitized, or it was put into a can or a bottle, uh, which was clean. So it leaves the brewery. It's hopefully stayed refrigerated. There's nothing else going on. So the beer arrives in your hand the way it's supposed to be. But if you look historically, especially in uh, England and the United States, where we see a lot of these, you really had no idea what you're going to get when you order beer in a bar, because it was probably brewed there or brewed nearby. It was kept in the cellar. It was in a, a wooden tank of some kind, a wooden barrel. You have no idea what kind of yeast have gotten in there. So if you're lucky, you get a good beer. But a, lo a lot of times you don't. So this is a, a great book on the history of beer in the United States uh, by Maureen Ogle. And she says, if you back in the 1800s and before, you had no idea what you're going to get. It could be sweet beer or sour, a thick, yeasty pleasure, or a rank broth with the taste and texture of muddy water. So what do you do if you get a bad beer? Well, you can add rum to it, you can add spices to it, you can add sugar. So it was uh, a lot more common back then when, when you had no idea what the quality of the beer was to think about ways that you could fix it, especially if it's coming out poorly uh, and uh, making it into a cocktail uh, well, bartenders have done that for years. Somebody gives you a bad product, so you've got to cover it up somehow. Uh, beer was often the same way. Reminds me of the first uh, beer cocktail that is documented by Charles Dickens, The Dog's Nose. Are you familiar with that one? I love The Dog's Nose, yeah, yes. The Dog's Nose is nice. <laughs> we'll, we'll have to talk about that one uh, in a little bit here. Uh, and then you also see this in old books. So this is uh, a book called The Flowing Bowl. It came out in 1892 uh, by William Schmidt, also known as The Only William. Uh, and he says people were adding all kinds of things to beer to cover up the defects. Uh, Indian hemp, sulfuric acid, sulfate of iron, even strychnia. Hopefully there's a little bit of exaggeration there because that would kill you. But uh, there's all kinds of tricks if you look through old bar manuals uh, that were practical books for people running pubs. And they were giving you advice on how to fix bad beer. So if you had a really old barrel, they would tell you take some new beer and pour it in. Uh, if it had gone completely flat, you would take bicarbonate of soda and throw that in the beer and uh, try to make it bubble again. So you, you, it's very unclear what you were getting, yet people drank beer all the time. Uh, and this, this next recipe is one we're, we're not going to serve. Uh, and I think you'll all be very thankful, not just the staff here, but uh, all of you in the audience. This is one of my favorite drinks uh, I came around. Uh, Customs and Fashions of Old New England, a book from 1891. Snail water was the name of this recipe, and it is actually made with snails. So it's a, I, well, we won't read the whole thing here, but it's an entire uh, peck of garden snails, uh, and the direction was to wash them in beer, uh, put them in an oven, and this is my favorite direction, you put them in the oven until they have done making a noise, uh, so, and then you uh, wipe away the green froth, uh, and then you mortar in a mortar and pestle, you grind up all the snails, shells and all, uh, add a whole bunch of herbs, which we don't have here, like uh, celandine, rosemary, bear's foot, agrimony, red dock roots, bark of blueberries. goes on and on. Uh, then you add earthworms, which you slid up and put in there and well. Uh, and this was a medicine. So the idea was if your kids were sick, this is what you made for them. I don't know if it worked, but it was a really good incentive to get better. Rich in protein. So, yeah. So be glad we didn't uh, make you guys try to do this, because I know these drinks were complicated enough. Uh, and then I'm going to jump ahead here for just a second, because uh, when, when we talk about the different drinks, we have seven different styles of beer cocktails, and we're going to serve a few of those, not all seven. Uh, but before we get too far ahead, I'll show you the, uh, the first style that you're tasting now is the, uh, the beer punch. And this is what you see in a lot of the old recipes uh, for how people were serving beer. And uh, if, you want to, if anybody wants to write things down, you can, but we can get recipes to you later. This is what we have in your glass right now. This is a drink called Blow My Skull. Uh, one of my favorite stories uh, of a beer cocktail. So uh, if you all know who David Wondrick is, probably the best uh, cocktail historian writing right now. Uh, when, when I was working on my book, I, I emailed David and said, you know, what's one recipe 
that I might not have heard of that you would know, and if anybody would know it, it's you. And this is what he came back to me with. Uh, it's from a, uh, the very first uh, English language cookbook from Australia in the 1800s. Uh, and this is a recipe that the governor of Tasmania would serve. And this guy was known for drinking absolutely everybody under the table. So he was completely fearsome appetite with alcohol, and people were afraid to come drink with him. And this was his punch, the blow my skull punch. And uh, at least the way we replicate it today, uh, you've got your classic five ingredients. Uh, you know, if you make a punch, you want something strong, something weak, something spice, sweet, and sour. So in a traditional punch here, we've got water, uh, sugar, uh, some very funky Jamaican rum with some big esters to it, uh, some porter, uh, brandy, and lime juice. And so thinking about how you make a punch, you could add water, you could add tea, you could add champagne. In this case, uh, you add beer. So we're using the uh, Lowlander beer, which uh, we've got there. Actually, not on this one. Yes, we do. Yeah, their porter, the Lowlander porter here. Uh, so they were very nice to provide that for us. Uh, so what do we think? Let's get some feedback. How's the punch? Strong? Yeah, we'll do that. <laughs> Anybody want to say anything about the cocktail? Like it? Don't like it? I want one. <laughs> oh, you don't have? You haven't got one. <laughs> We didn't get one either. We should oh. fix that. <laughs> um, Hold on. I'll check behind the stage if we can get one for you. <laughs> yeah. uh, also, another great uh, takeaway from uh, this guy's uh, story, which I'd never heard of, was a phrase called heel taps. And heel taps are the, I, I had to look up, up this word. It's, if you have a shot, it's like the, and you, you don't want to drink the whole thing. It's that last little bit of liquor that you could hide in the glass and make it look like you drank it. That's called a heel tap, a little old slang. So what he would do when he would serve this punch is it would come out and he would say, no heel taps. <laughs> Everybody's got to empty their glass. So we're, we're not getting one, you're not getting one. Oh, so they're all gone. <laughs> the other, uh, my other, uh, a great book you should look up as well if you're into punches is um, there's a book of recipes uh, all from the school of Oxford uh, where they recorded, uh, it's called Oxford Nightcaps and it's all the different recipes that the, the guys in the fraternity houses at Oxford in the 1800s would use to drink together. And it's way more sophisticated than like a frat house recipe you would expect today. Uh, but they had a lot of uh, English ale punches. And uh, the way they would serve these oftentimes is actually in a, a large communal bowl and they would pass it around the room. And this is a, a really funny story. Uh, there's one called the Oxford Grace Cup. And the story came about on uh, how they said that the, the evil Danes would invade England. And apparently what these treacherous Danish people would do is they would get the Englishman to drink. And while the Englishman drank the cup, they would come in and stab him from behind. And so to, to so they, for this one, to guard That's against... That's quite a martial history for a cocktail. It's what? Quite a martial history for a cocktail. <laughs> it is, yeah. So to guard it, so the way this tradition uh, came about is you would fill the bowl with an, uh, an ale punch and you would pass it around the table and each person would drink from the bowl while the person on his right and left stood guard, made sure there are no Danes coming in with their knives as, uh, as they do apparently. I work for a Danish company do, now, I can't... Do we can't have any know. Danes in, uh, in, the, in the audience? No. Oh. <laughs> All right, we're safe. <laughs> but uh, so yes, think of using beer, that's the takeaway for this one, but think of using beer as a punch ingredient because uh, it's, a, it's a great way to make a beer cocktail at home if you're entertaining, uh, and it's uh, very easy. You don't have to mix individual drinks. So here the question is not so much why would you ever make a beer cocktail, but it's why did we stop making beer cocktails? I think that's uh, the more interesting question to come out, and uh, a lot of transitions historically uh, that I think caused this. Uh, one of the biggest ones is people stopped drinking punch. Uh, punch faded away, it became less a thing about having all your friends come together at the pub or at the, at the house and sharing one thing, and more about having a cocktail, something that you yourself want to just, just for you, and it's your own individual drink. Uh, and so as cocktails took over, all these old beer punch recipes kind of faded away. A similar change uh, shifted, especially in the United States, probably less so here. Uh, but in the US, we were always an ale country. And so all these old beer cocktail recipes were, were made with ales, uh, especially English style, really malty. Uh, and what happened is uh, our technology changed. Uh, we had German brewers coming in. Uh, then we had our rail lines created, which linked the entire country. And uh, most importantly, we had the refrigerated rail car. And so for the first time, it was possible to deliver cold lager all throughout the United States. And that's how our first big breweries came about. And when you do that, uh, like if you imagine this punch you have right now, if you, if you took that old recipe for a malty English punch and then replaced that with 
a crisp German lager, it's not going to oh. work. So, so a lot of these old recipes, nothing against German lagers, but different recipe, not going to work. And so these uh, recipes disappeared. And then in the and United States. It's, it's actually not that easy to get a, a multi English Christmas ale in, uh, in Germany. Right, uh, yeah. I tried. <laughs> <laughs> and in the United States, too, I mean, multi ales are out of fashion even now. Uh, it's hard to find a good multi beer. And then the, the big disastrous events, if you were a drinker, and if you weren't a drinker uh, in the 20th century, we had World War I, World War II, and Prohibition. So that stacked up about 30 years of just terrible impacts on drinking culture. Uh, Prohibition obviously being the worst for drinks in particular. Uh, but that represented a huge loss of knowledge uh, for how these drinks were made. And then once we shift... Jacob, what? should we send the second cocktail out? Yeah, yeah, please. Yeah, okay. uh, we, can, we can get the next one going. <laughs> Especially this for time you. you're getting your, the first yours one. first. Hold on. <laughs> Yeah, and so with, uh, with that transition, when we come out of World War II, now instead of uh, drinking at the pub, we have a lot more people drinking at home. And so you have a transition uh, from having multi-ingredient drinks to having instead just uh, one beer that you would pull out of the refrigerator. So as it was put, the, uh, the future of American beer was less in the, uh, in the pub and more in the icebox. It's just something you could pull out at home. So all these things led to this forgotten knowledge so that by 1949, when that Esquire book came out, even though there were some recipes for beer cocktails in the book, they were just kind of hanging around. Nobody was actually making them at that point. But let's think about why you would. Think about the flavors that you, uh, you see in beer. Uh, pretty much all five basic tastes you can get in beer in uh, various forms. So if you want something bitter, hops, dark roasted malts in like a porter or a stout. If you pick out the right beer, you can, you can bring those in. If you want sour, obviously sour beers are hugely popular now. So Berliner Weiss here in Germany would be one. You've got your fruit lambics. Uh, you've got just straight sour lambics as well. Uh, so if you want to bring acidity to a cocktail, you can choose a beer that would do that. Uh, and then sweetness. Uh, if, uh, mo beers can be very dry, but you can have some very sweet beers if you have residual sugars left over from the malt. So this is where we think about uh, like an imperial stout, maybe, or uh, a Belgian quadruple, or a, a very rich malty English ale, which nobody drinks outside of England anymore, unfortunately. Uh, salt would be the fourth, fourth taste, which you don't really see that often, but you could get a goza. Some of, the, some of them are fairly salty. Uh, and then umami would be the last, and I don't know how often you see that here, but we are starting to get some savory beers in the United States. Uh, so I've seen brewers, uh, oyster stouts are coming back. Yeah, there's also classic beers like the Porterhouse Oyster Stout from Dublin, mm. um, which is both umami and salty. So yeah, perfect. Even, even classic beers do that. Yeah, and then I've seen them with uh, meat, which... Uh, Mixed quality on some of the, the meat beers I've had, but we, uh, we have had some, some brews made with actual chunks of meat thrown in, into the brew kettles. Uh, we had one called Captain Beefheart, uh, which was made with grilled beef hearts uh, in Oregon, uh, in Denver. And uh, obviously the Rocky Mountain Oyster Stout. That's right? the one, yes, the Rocky Mountain Oysters, which if you've been to Denver and you had the oysters, you didn't have oysters. It's... They're not oysters. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and then, so, then let's think about uh, flavor affinities, too with uh, what kind of beer you might mix with what kind of spirit. So th these are just some general guidelines I've put together through testing out various recipes. Uh, so if you have a saison, like a farmhouse ale, uh, to me that goes really well with aromatic spirits. So gin and saison is just an awesome pairing. You can make that work really easily. Um, aquavit from Scandinavia, you have a little bit more savory botanical quality. Uh, aperitifs like um, Campari and Aperol can play really well with the saison. Uh, and then citrus is just a natural match. I mean, people already add, you know, orange peel to some farmhouse Vitch ale. Beers. Yeah. What's that? If you have a Belgian Vitch beer. Yeah, exactly. It, uh, it perfectly pairs with a gin fizz, for example. Mm -hmm. Just uh, top it with the, with the Vitch beer, natural pairing. It's yeah, very, very easy. Very tasty. Um, IPAs can be a little bit uh, trickier to work with. Obviously, you have a lot more flavor, a lot more bitterness. Uh, so with IPA, I tend to go with uh, more of a smaller drink. Uh, that's actually what we have. We have IPA in the cocktail that's coming out. Does it, did it out come out? Yeah. So that cocktail has uh, IPA in it. And uh, I tend to go tropical with, with IPAs, especially if you can get like tropical hops. Uh, but my favorite, my favorite use for these so far is in uh, tiki-style cocktails. So if you think about uh, most tiki drinks, uh, they're usually rum-based, and they have a lot of spice, and they have a lot of citrus, and they have a lot of sweetness. But they don't have a lot of bitterness most of the time. Uh, and so the IPA is a great way to uh, 
to uh, pump up uh, a, a drink with, uh, that's too sweet. You can use the IPA, and it plays really well with those tropical flavors. Uh, lagers, obviously crisper, lighter, uh, so the spirit can show through there. Uh, I feel like uh, agave spirits and lager go really well. Uh, those have been drunk together forever. Uh, so also, uh, what's in the drink that they're having right now? Uh, yes, well, uh, that one is a uh, funny story on that one. Uh, I, uh, I was at a cocktail, beer cocktail event in Australia uh, at a bar that was a little bit unprepared. So I showed up, and uh, they didn't have any of the ingredients for the drink that we needed. So I looked around the bar, and uh, we, need, we had 25 people showing up for cocktails in an hour. We had to put something together. And they had a bottle of Aquavit, and they had a bottle of Falernum, and we had IPA. So it just kind of all came together. So this is essentially a tiki cocktail, but made with Aquavit instead of rum. Uh, so we've got uh, Aquavit, lime juice, uh, Falernum, which is a ginger and clove syrup that's used in uh, some tiki cocktails, uh, and then the, the uh, Lowlander IPA. Uh, and a couple dashes of uh, Angostura bitters. How's that one working out? Out of curiosity. Good. All right. And uh, do you be, before mixing, do you stir the carbonation out of uh, the IPA? I shake it right in. Just, just shake it out. Shake it all in. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Malty beers. Uh, whis here we start thinking about darker spirits like uh, whiskey, rum, uh, cognac, and also bringing in spice elements. And then porters and stouts can play really well with your really dark spirits, your whiskey, your amari, uh, cream and sugar and dairy, uh, which we'll get into in a little bit. So now that we've covered this, this kind of techniques, let's talk about uh, seven styles of beer cocktails. So this is how you can think about how to make a beer drink uh, of various kinds. You've already, the first one would be punches, uh, which you already had. Uh, the next one would be prepared beers. Uh, do you drink micheladas here? Does that come up very often? Sometimes. Sometimes, yeah. <laughs> certain, certain Mexican restaurants now have them all the time. Okay. Yeah, so sim similar idea. Uh, with, with prepared beer, the, the beer is the main ingredient. So if you're doing uh, the cocktail, it's probably maybe a full 12-ounce bottle of beer. Uh, but the idea is the beer you're using is probably pretty light and honestly maybe even boring. So you want to mix it up somehow. So uh, the michelada would be kind of the, the flagship example of this. A uh, cocktail from Mexico where you take a, a Mexican lager and then you add things like, depending on where you are in the country, you can add lime juice, you can add hot salsa, you can add salt, and you, you basically create like a savory, almost Bloody Mary style drink out of the beer uh, and make it a lot more interesting than what you started with. Where does the name come from? Is it uh, because you're using Michelob lager? Or? I've never got a good, good answer on that. I don't know. It's, okay. Uh, the, other, the other example you see of this is the Picon beer. Uh, if you're in France, which is taking a French lager and uh, Amer Picon, which is a bitter orange liqueur, and then you just throw that into your lager and uh, it spices it up nicely, gives a little bit more complexity than you would have otherwise. Uh, the next one, uh, beer topped cocktails. We're not serving one of these today either, uh, but this is what you, I probably see the most of uh, when I see people making beer cocktails, uh, and I think I've probably the kind that uh, Robert Simonson had when he was complaining about bad ones, because I've had a lot of really bad cocktails that are made this way, but the idea is you start with a base that is, could essentially be a cocktail on its own, so you'd probably do uh, a spirit and a sour and a sweet element of some kind, uh, and you have something that tastes good, and then you pour beer on top and hope you don't ruin it. <laughs> and a lot of the time, like I said, you could end up just ruining the beer and ruining the cocktail if you do this. So the idea is to try to find a beer that actually makes sense to play with the ingredients that you're using. Mm. This one here is uh, one that caught on in part because of the name, but uh, it's kind of my take on a Harvey Wallbanger. Uh, another cocktail that's not very complicated in its classic form, it's uh, vodka, orange juice, and Galliano. I don't know, did this catch on outside of the United States? Yeah, sure. Yeah. I mean, okay. in the cocktail scene, definitely. Okay, cool. So yeah, in the, in the US, it's a cocktail that caught on and then thankfully died out. Uh, so when I worked for Galliano, I wanted to try to revive this, so we decided let's get rid of the vodka, use more Galliano, top it with orange juice, and then uh, top it with Hefeweizen. And Hefeweizen, if you think about the flavor affinities, it goes really well with orange. Like you said, it's a whipped beer, orange peel, citrus already naturally play together. And orange and anise and vanilla go together really naturally too. So you can see how the beer and the cocktail ingredients uh, play well together. Ah. Next up, the beer incorporated cocktails. These are the ones where you you take just a little bit of beer and you shake it in just like everything else. So if you're making your cocktail uh, behind the stage, you would 
pour everything in, including the beer, which makes people nervous. People are afraid that if you put beer in a shaker and shake it up, it's just going to go everywhere, which it can. So you only use it like an ounce or two. So uh, for should, these, yeah. Should we go for the, the third one? Yeah, we can get the, uh, the hot one. Yeah, and get that going too. Uh, so with these, uh, yeah, you got it. <laughs> Uh, the idea is just get a very flavorful beer, so like uh, an imperial IPA, a regular IPA, something that's got enough flavor that if you shake it up, uh, it's going to come through. So this is my favorite uh, one of these, called a Mai Tai PA. So basically the same construction of what you have in the, uh, that Carwin Viking, which is the next one uh, that we'll show you, the one that you've been drinking. Uh, but the idea is just taking that very strong beer, shaking it right in. So with this one, I took a classic uh, Mai Tai, so rum, almond syrup, also known as orjat. Uh, lime juice, and um, orange curacao, uh, and then just added an ounce and a half of IPA to that. And so when you shake it up, that IPA gives it a nice frothiness and a little bit of bitterness uh, that uh, comes through. Which cocktail should be next? Uh, so I'm forgetting sure. what we have left here. What do we have? We have the, um, the hot one. Yeah, go for it. What is that? Oh, yeah, we can, uh, yes, do that. I, forget what, what, I don't remember what the fourth cocktail is. <laughs> to check the notes. Um, yes, and then this is the Carwin Viking, by the way. So if you're ever in uh, Melbourne, Australia, that's the uh, Carwin is Carwin Cellars is an amazing beer shop, uh, not an amazing cocktail bar because they didn't have any of the ingredients we needed. So <laughs> that's where that story came out of. Uh, beer syrups. Oh, we can do the nog too. The nog, uh, if that's ready, we can send them out whenever they're up. Uh, so beer syrups. Uh, this is a, a good way if you're behind the bar. And let's say you don't have beer on tap, and you're not going through a high volume of beer. Uh, this can be a problem with making beer cocktails is you have waste. So like, if you have to open a bottle of beer and you only use an ounce for the cocktail, and you can't just sit there and drink it behind the bar probably, and you don't want your chef to be drinking all the beer either, it can go to waste. So a good thing to do is to uh, make a beer syrup. So again, you want something really flavorful because you're only going to use a little bit because you could lose it. But take something like uh, an imperial stout, uh, add demerara sugar to it, uh, do like a two to one sh sugar, just like you would making a simple syrup, but use beer instead of water. Uh, and then you can use that uh, really rich stout syrup in an old fashioned, uh, for example. That works really well. Uh, you can do it in a whiskey sour. Uh, also, the, uh, the really bad lambics, those like super fruity, super sweet, not really lambics, but they call them lambics, like uh, the raspberry ones, perfect for this. So that's what this drink was. Uh, essentially, a uh, gin sour, uh, with, but instead of uh, using sugar for the sweetener, just taking one of those really sweet raspberry beers, simmering it down with sugar, uh, and you can add spices and other syrup, other things to it as well. Uh, Even hops, you, if you want to. What's I've that? Once, I've once tried a, a very, very good uh, wheat beer syrup, so oh, Belgian yeah. wheat beer style, and uh, they turned that into a honey syrup, and then added some hops, fresh hops oh, from cool. the field. So That's a neat idea. Yeah. It's yeah. also quite a nice uh, to add some more, uh, say, punch to the witch beer because usually they're quite mild. Right. Uh, we had another recipe contribution as well that used, um, they made an orjat with beer. So with the orjat, if you ever make it, you're basically blanching almonds in hot water with sugar. Uh, and instead of using hot water, he used hot beer. He used, took it a, a Russian imperial stout, blanched almonds, and it ended up with this really nutty, malty, dark, roasty syrup. It was really nice. Nice. Uh, next topic is uh, flips. So th these can be uh, really fun. Uh, flips uh, have kind of an interesting history, especially in the United States, where the, the meaning of a flip cocktail has completely flipped. Uh, it doesn't mean at all what it did initially. So the original definition of a flip would be uh, basically any cocktail made with beer and served hot. And now that's completely changed. It's almost always served cold, doesn't have beer, and has a whole egg. So this drink went through this very strange evolution. Uh, but speaking of the cold versions, uh, eggs and dark beer can play really, really well together. So the idea with the flip is you, you want to get something really dark and rich. It's more usually a dessert drink. So in this example uh, that's on the screen here, that's uh, Averna, which is really dark, bittersweet amaro with uh, about an ounce of the richest, chocolatiest stout that you can find, a whole egg, just crack it in there. Uh, some bitters and then shake it up. And Havana usually goes very well with coffee flavors. Yes, so absolutely. If you have like a very roasty stout, you already have the coffee flavors in there. I don't know how many people are uh, familiar with uh, the, the German barley malt coffee replacement. 
<laughs> um, it's called Landcafé. Uh, it's, it's made from barley malt, and uh, the malt is roasted to a point where you basically have coffee-like flavors. So they should go well with Havana naturally. Yeah, absolutely. And then the, the one that we're going to have coming out for you today uh, to, to keep things a little, a little more simplified is one to make at home. Uh, this is a beer nog. So uh, if you ever had an eggnog, uh, this is the same idea but with beer. So uh, this is a great recipe from a bartender in Seattle. Uh, and what, what you're doing with a, with a nog is you're whisking cream and uh, eggs together and then adding spirits and whatever else and sugar and whatever else you like. Yeah, go for it. That's fine. We're going to... Is that the hot one? Yeah, you can take it out. Either one. Yeah, go for it. <laughs> go for it. Yeah. Sorry, we've got the, the nog coming for you right now. We had two drinks going at once, which was my fault there. Uh, but yeah, so the, the fun thing about eggnog is you can actually age it. The bartender who created this actually does a barrel-aged beer eggnog. So she takes this uh, nog that we have in front of you. Uh, puts the whole thing in a barrel, and then puts the entire barrel in a refrigerator. Is it a bourbon barrel by any chance? Uh, I, don't, I think it's small. It's just like a small wooden barrel. Just wooden? Just wood. Just oak. But you could do bourbon. Absolutely. Uh, so you can keep eggnog around for years. I've, I think I've had about four or five-year-old eggnog. And, uh, that, and you obviously, you keep it refrigerated. Um, but this is a really fun thing to do. Is eggnog big here? Do people yeah, drink sure, it? especially yeah. around Christmas time. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, same in the United States. This is a Christmas drink. Uh, so this one that we have in front of you is uh, cognac. Uh, we've got uh, the Lowlander Porter once again, which uh, goes really well on this. They've got uh, what, it's licorice in the, the licorice porter. and vanilla. Yeah, licorice and vanilla in their porter. So that works really well with this kind of holiday drink. Uh, and then milk and cream and eggs, uh, sugar, uh, additional vanilla and nutmeg. So it's something that's really easy to make at home. You just have to whisk all these eggs together and then throw everything in. We have some this time. Ah, yes. <laughs> cool, so we finally get to join you in drinking this one. So cheers. Thank you for having me. What do we think of the, the eggnog? We're done? Yeah, cool. Woohoo! All right, I'll tell my friend. This isn't my recipe, so I can't take any credit or blame. So <laughs> it's convenient. I like the way the porter comes through on this. That was a, a good choice. And if you make this, uh, my advice would be to either make it and serve it right away or age it for a few months. And then you can, everything will really mellow out. I can you... actually very well imagine this aged in a bourbon barrel just oh, naturally yeah. tastes like it. <laughs> yeah, it would be cool. Putting it in a barrel is a little riskier because you have to make sure your barrel is really clean, obviously. So I don't know if I would do that, but you can certainly try. And, well, you can uh, always make it stronger. Make it what? Uh, mix the cocktail in a stronger fashion, more alcohol. You can alcohol always do that, too. Yeah. <laughs> always an option. All right, and this last c category that we're going to have for you is uh, what I call hot helpers. And uh, this, is, this is not my word for it. It was uh, from Charles Baker. And this is hot beer drinks, which is not really what people think of. They don't think of beer served hot. In fact, I don't know if you see this here, but in the United States, uh, we have cold beer as the advertisement. This is our cold activated can. I don't know if you have this technology in Germany. No, no so you, you guys could learn, th learn something from the United States here. Yep, this, sometimes. Uh, these fancy cans, the mountains turn blue when the beer is cold all the way through. So when, when the only thing that you can say about your beer is that it's really cold, this is the can that you want. But if you have more positive attributes to highlight, you probably don't need this. Uh, but yeah, hot helpers. So in, uh, this book is Gentleman's Companion by uh, Charles Baker. And uh, what, what, it's a collection of recipes that he's kind of known for being a, a great writer and a great adventurous cocktail person, but giving you recipes that don't actually taste very good or work out. And this book is a great example of that. None of the hot drinks that he had in his book were particularly nice. But we, uh, I love the name, Hot Helpers, so we go with that. And uh, so this is a book called In Praise of Ale, talking about how hot beer drinks sort of faded away. Um, this came out in 1893, and people were already lamenting the loss of hot beer drinks. So he says, it's a matter of regret that some of the more comforting drinks have gone out of date. When beer was the staple drink, morning, noon, and night, it was natural that our ancestors would prefer their breakfast beer warm and their nightcaps flavored. So it's very typical to have a hot beer, maybe in the morning. Uh, and then uh, you, you can see the same thing uh, again, this book on uh, customs and fashions of old New England. Uh, people would come into a tavern. Uh, and uh, the flip, which was, again, the hot version, not the, the cold version with eggs, would be served. 
And then this is my favorite old historical thing about warm beer. Uh, so this sounds really weird to us today, but back in the uh, late 1400s and 1500s when this came out, people actually had pseudoscientific debates about whether it was healthy to drink beer cold. And uh, a lot of people said that it wasn't. And the reasoning for this was they, they had no idea how the digestive system worked. So in the classical view of how digestion worked, uh, was it was a continuation of the cooking process. So they thought that your stomach was basically another oven. So you would take your food and it would go and cook on the stove or in the oven, and then you would eat it and your internal oven would keep cooking the food. So if, you, if your stomach is an oven, the worst thing you could possibly do is drink something cold. And so this entire book came out uh, making the case for uh, never drinking beer cold. And the argument was that if you want to be healthy, you have to drink your beer hot. And it's a really dumb argument. And they, <laughs> they had uh, some really fanciful examples of, like examples of uh, well, The warriors. Heineken zero, comp zero campaign is not going to like that one, eh? Yeah, zero evidence. But, but they would have stories about like warriors who uh, came back from battle, and they were totally fine, but they had exerted themselves so much that as soon as they drank something cold, they died right on the spot. And then they'd tell stories of uh, like people eating vast meals and feasts and then drinking cold beer, and then they just vomit up the entire meal, but not like, not like vomit, but like intact, so like entire steaks just come, come back out. Well, this, is, this makes no sense. This is clearly false, but, but they made it into the book, and it's like a 30-page like book making this argument, but it ends with this, uh, this poem in commendation of warm ale. And you can kind of get some insight into uh, why they thought the way they did and what the argument was. Uh, and so it, it's basically a young person arguing with his grandparents uh, who don't want him to drink his beer warm. He want, they want him to drink it cold. And he's saying, I don't care what grandsires say, but reason doth and ought to bear this way. So it doesn't matter what your folktales say, the reason tells you you should drink your beer hot. And then he accuses his grandparents of uh, having lost their teeth because they drink their beer cold. And he said their lungs would be in better shape. The, and then my favorite part, um, he, he says, uh, the name and nature of the vital, it was more to save your fire and fear that I, your Peter Cups, should melt or smokeify. So he's accusing them of not letting him use their Peter Cups because they'll ruin him, as opposed to actually looking out for his health. And then he, he finally ends, though grandsire growl, though grand dame swear, I hold that man unwise that drinks his liquor cold. It's a strong conclusion. So this last drink we have for you is mulled ale. This is straight from uh, Cedric Dickens, who is Charles Dickens' uh, great-grandson. And he put out a book in the 1980s uh, called Drinking with Dickens, basically collecting uh, stories of drinking in the Dickens era. So this one is as simple as you can get. Uh, you just take a really good malty beer. So in this case, we got the Anchor Holiday Edition. Uh, so you, and then you add cognac, brown sugar, and some winter spices, heat the whole thing up, garnish it with an orange. Uh, very nice and simple. Uh, hopefully that all came together really well. It's kind of a tricky one. Uh, come back good? All right. Uh, but th this, when you talk about drinks that went out of style because the beer style changed, this is a great example. Uh, so I actually, when my book came out, I got to write an article about uh, this, all the stuff about hot beer. Uh, and it was for The Atlantic, but for some reason they wouldn't let me include a recipe. And so they only wanted the background, but no recipe. And so, sure so enough, somebody from a different publication was like, this is a cool idea, I've got to try it. And they went out and they just went to the grocery store and bought six different beers of all, all kinds, and then served these to their friends to see if this hot beer thing actually worked out. And so they ended up serving hot IPA and hot Budweiser <laughs> and a lot of terrible drinks uh, because they, they wouldn't let me include this. So the key really is finding the right beer because uh, if you, that maltiness is the key. You want that residual sugar. You don't want hops because it'll taste more bitter if once you have the hops. Uh, and you mentioned the dog's nose. The dog's nose cocktail? Yeah. Yeah, so this is another fun one that I really wanted to include. Uh, also going back to Dickens, which was, um, well, the, the way I read about it, well, it, well, it's in his story is the best way to start. It's a, a meeting of a temperance society, and they're telling the story of someone who has suddenly given up drink because he lost the use of his arm because uh, he drank so many of this drink called the dog's nose that he got injured at work uh, with, a, with a needle, and it got infected, and now he can't use his arm anymore, so he's sworn off alcohol forever, which is probably not the best intro to that drink. Uh, but the, the way I read about it was uh, gin, porter, and uh, sugar served hot. 
And I first came across the recipe, this was before we had all these great new spirits to work with. So we had London dry gin, Guinness, and sugar with the instruction to put the whole thing in a pint glass and put it in the microwave and heat it up for a couple minutes. And it was terrible, absolutely terrible. So uh, again, choosing the right beer helps a lot. So revisiting this when I wrote the book, uh, going with something maltier like a Geneva or an Old Tom gin that's a little bit sweeter works a lot better than a London dry. Uh, and a more classic porter like uh, Anchor or something with some residual malt as opposed to... I like to using the bitter. Fuller's London Porter because it's almost from the same time, the recipe. It's from 1845. Oh, cool. Yeah. So yeah. it's that almost would be a the great right time. choice. Yeah. And uh, uh, we usually sprinkle a little bit of uh, nutmeg on top. Always a good call. And then getting to the weirdest recipe in the book that... So far, nobody has ever come back to me to tell me that they've actually made this, and I suspect that's the case. Uh, posset. And this is an example of what they would call an ale meal. Uh, so it was essentially your food and your drink all together in one thing. And you see this in Shakespeare. Uh, you see it in lots of old works. But the idea is uh, you, you take your, your beer and you heat it up along with any other ingredients you want to use, and then you pour it into milk or cream, and the whole thing curdles. So this is the, the most unattractive photo in the book. Like that's, that's the curds that come out. But the idea is once you strain those curds out, you have this really nice, almost like warm eggnog type liquid left at the bottom. Uh, and it can be surprisingly good. It can also be really terrible. Like I, I subjected my friends to so many versions of this drink trying to get it right, and most of them were, were bad. Uh, but, but the way they would eat it would, would be with a, a posset pot, which kind of looks something like this. But the, the key to the posset pot was uh, you would have a spout that went to the very bottom of it. And so you would, you would pour your hot beer and your cream and your spices and sugar all into this vessel. And then if you wanted to drink, you would just tip it up and you would drink out of the spout. And if you were hungry, you would dip in a spoon and you would eat the curds. You just eat the whole thing in one, in one go. Uh, I tried nice. the curds, it's not good. <laughs> we, people did this uh, because they were very poor. So now we don't have to do this now. We can just enjoy the liquid part and, and let the curds go. Uh, and then the last thing uh, I want to talk about is the flip. And so we'll, we'll do a little demo here for you if we can. Uh, but the, the original flip was made with uh, a loggerhead. And so the idea was, uh, we got it? Yeah, it's coming up. I don't know if, we'll, if we've got enough heat here, but we'll do this. And I'm going to close my laptop because I don't want this to get all over it. Uh, but the old flips were a very simple recipe, just beer, rum, and sugar. Nothing else added. So the uh, little bit of uh, dark sugar, some beer, something malty. So we're measuring this one really carefully. And uh, some Jamaican rum. Cool, let's see what we can get here. And now comes the hot poker. <laughs> so ideally, we'll see what kind of reaction we can get on this. Uh, if you really do this well, it can get uh, very, very hot. Oh, we're going to get some of it. You can, you can see the steam coming off. There we go. You can see, so this is why it's called a flip. Because there's once, a lot of once, foam once generated in the cup right now. So we can show you videos later if you want. We didn't have uh, quite, the, quite the heat we wanted. But you can tell this is still really, really hot coming off of there, but you can actually get it glowing red. And uh, so I think that comes out to about 1,200 degrees once you get that fully hot. Um, let's see how. This is a little warm, actually, but if you grip it by the top, or I can, we can pass this around. Will the mics freak out if I go forward? All right, cool. Whichever way you want. If you want to just get the aroma on that, and you can pass it around, you might want to hold it from the top. Okay. Yeah. So what, uh, when you do this drink, uh, what makes it really unique because uh, when we do hot drinks most of the time now, we'll, we'll just put them on a stove. You heat it up until you hit the desired temperature. Uh, with these, you're, you're not just heating it up gently, you're caramelizing the sugars. So if there's any, any sugar that's left in there, you hit it with something that's 1,200 degrees, it's going to instantly have that Maillard reaction. Uh, and so you get entirely different flavors. You get really roasted notes. Uh, my favorite tasting note ever actually was um, a chef who came to an event where we were doing, serving this drink. And we, were, we had two of these loggerheads, and we were just taking turns putting them in the fire and taking them out. And he took, he took one taste, and he said, it tastes like a Civil War battlefield. <laughs> so you, you, you get the iron and everything. It's very metallic, uh, but also caramelized and charred. 
There's a German version of this, uh, yeah. which is called Steinbier, Stone Beer, yes. um, where they use hot stones and throw them into the mash. And also the sugar caramelizes around the stones, but instead of iron, you get a mineral-like taste in the beer. It's quite fascinating. Yeah, and it's, and it's, uh, it's something you don't see in cocktails very often, and you certainly don't see it in beer as often. Uh, but it, it's, it's an overlooked way to, to add complexity to it is by not just making something hot, but getting that intense caramelization. Uh, so that mostly covers what I had. So we can open it up to uh, Q&A if, if anyone has any questions or comments on uh, mixing with beer. Just raise your hand if you have a question. Uh, what kind of temperatures do you use for uh, working with the beer when, when, you, when you decrease the, the amount of beer, I mean by heating it? Do you use some certain uh, temperatures? I mean, oh, you, yeah. Do, like what temperatures do you get to? Uh, yeah, for, for a beer reduction, actually. I to mean, if you do a reduction of a beer, what uh, kind of I just is? bring it to a low simmer on okay. a stove top. But nothing above like 60 degrees or something like this? Uh, okay. Yeah, I mean, I could bring it up to 100 and then gentle it down. I'd probably ease it down after Still that. Still need some gentle touch, right? Yeah, gentle heat's usually the, the way to go. If you try to make a beer syrup, you go in too hot and then you pour something, you pour the beer into <laughs> it, you just get foam. Yeah, I definitely have to keep an eye out. I've, heard, I've had that happen in my own kitchen, and I've heard other people have that oh, issue yeah. as well.